So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our um, keynote speaker, John Harris. Uh, and John Harris, um, if you've read his bio, is, was one of the founding editors of Political. He was uh, very involved in the launch of Political Europe. And before that, for two decades, he uh, was first a reporter and finally an editor at the Washington Post. Uh, he told me that his one other trip to Sofia was, I think, 25 years ago as a reporter, maybe a White House reporter, uh, for the Washington Post. And he was here with, I think it was Secretary of Defense Perry during the Clinton administration. So this is his actually his second uh, visit to Sofia. May I welcome John Harris. I appreciate that. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, good morning. Um, well, look, I am here under uh, 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 something short of my ideal circumstances. Uh, as David said, for my second visit uh, to Sofia, my preference would be to come here, meet interesting journalists, uh, listen, but no speech. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the invitation. If I want the invitation, I give a speech. Uh, so here I'm aware, but uh, here I am. Uh, but uh, you sh this is my, uh, my second choice, which is appropriate because I'm actually the second choice of uh, David McDonald, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 a great hero of mine, somebody I've admired uh, for 40 years is uh, Jim Fallows, the, uh, uh, the incomparable writer for The Atlantic. He sits on the WPI board. He's a, a friend of mine. He was uh, originally hoping to come here. Uh, uh, but could not because of some scheduling constraints. So uh, th that's about the most uh, distinguished uh, substitute I've ever had uh, to, to uh, be the replacement for, for Jim Fallows. But I hope you get to hear from him uh, sometime soon because he's always uh, worth listening to. Uh, David McDonald, uh, WPI, uh, we've so enjoyed getting to know you at Politico and hosting, uh, including some people in this audience that we've played host to uh, at, in our newsroom uh, in Washington, and I really appreciate the invitation. Nancy Schiller, uh, so nice to get to know you and your organization uh, that doing such great work and we've so appreciated your hospitality. I've so appreciated your hospitality uh, as has everybody, I'm sure. So I I'm willing to give a speech uh, but not a sermon. Um, I I'm really here at this conference to, to, to learn, not to lecture. Um, I, I really don't wish to become a particularly ridiculous type of American journalist that we've seen a lot of in the Trump years, and, and that's the journalist who thinks that uh, uh, they're indulging a fantasy, uh, that just because uh, we as reporters are insulted uh, by a, an erratic and buffoonish uh, president during the Trump years, that that somehow puts us on the front lines of freedom, uh, even as we're, uh, we're, we're taking car services to our, our cable TV hits uh, and all the rest. Uh, Paul knows exactly what I'm talking about. This seems to me a particularly frivolous conceit all over the world, not in the United States, but all over the world. Uh, journalists are risking harassment, uh, imprisonment, even death uh, to practice our craft, uh, to shine a light on power, to represent our audience, uh, and, and to engage in that most, most basic impulse of human nature, which is to tell good stories. Uh, we in the United States don't face any of those threats for all the fact that we, we do sometimes see uh, uh, journalists disrespected and, and it bothers us to see uh, people uh, attacking basic principles uh, of our craft. I think all Americans have to realize how fortunate we are. We live in a political culture uh, that supports free and independent press. That culture is embedded in a law uh, with long precedent in protecting uh, free and independent press. And I'm acutely aware that around the world and even here in this part, uh, this region of Europe, that is not the case. Deeply admiring of people who practice journalism under circumstances far more difficult than anything I've had to, uh, to ever face uh, in, in my 35 years uh, of journalism. So uh, I'm, I'm here really to, uh, out of uh, respect and to listen and learn from your stories uh, rather than to, uh, to tell my own. Um, uh, David did invite me to tell the story of uh, Politico, which is just uh, a few months away from our 15th anniversary. Uh, and uh, to me, it is a, 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 an interesting story. It's one I'm proud of. Uh, a small group of us set out uh, in late 2006 and early 2007. Uh, to, we, we left our 
pretty secure jobs uh, to try something new. We believed that the, it was possible to, uh, 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 or we were interested in finding out, we didn't know for sure, whether it would be possible to build a new publication, show that there's a model, uh, an economic model that would support something we deeply believe in, uh, which is high quality independent journalism. That's what we set out to do. It was initially a very small group. There were, uh, there was three or four of us who were the founders and then maybe there was a two or three dozen uh, who uh, were rash enough to join us right at the outset. Uh, and now we've grown over these years uh, to about a thousand uh, journalists and business uh, professionals uh, in the United States, uh, largely in Washington, but in multiple states around the country. And uh, as I hope some of you here know in Europe, where we've got a major operation, Politico Europe, uh, based out of uh, uh, Brussels, uh, but with pretty big footprints in the uh, in, uh, United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, uh, and with real plans to grow throughout Europe. So um, we've gone from maybe 36 to 1,000, and we hope to, uh, to, to, keep, uh, to keep growing. Uh, it's a story that, as I say, uh, it's been the work of my professional life, and I'm quite committed to it, but I want to be very careful about drawing too many lessons uh, from the experience of Politico uh, applying to uh, people in other circumstances, journalists trying to, uh, to, uh, to meet the challenge uh, of a robust business model tied to a robust editorial model, but in, but in other settings and other circumstances. I'm very good friends uh, with the with the editor of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. We sometimes trade notes. Uh, his problems in, in helping sustain a major metropolitan daily or those of Brian McGrory. Uh, Rene Sanchez is my friend uh, in uh, the Twin Cities. Brian McGrory, uh, the nephew of Mary McGrory, Paul, uh, at, at the uh, Boston Globe. Uh, uh, we sometimes talk. And, and the, the, the challenge of uh, meeting the, the editorial imperative and the business imperative are different everywhere. Uh, in every circumstance. So I'm not drawing too many um, uh, lessons from, for publishing from my example in, uh, with Politico. We cover politics and we are in places where there are, uh, where there are hubs of power and lots of money uh, 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 flowing around uh, those centers of influence. We've been able to build a publishing model that, that you know, bluntly taps into some of that money, mo uh, that money to, to produce the kind of journalism we believe in. Might be a quite different challenge uh, in uh, a place like Sofia or lots of other places around the world. So I, I've tried to think about the circumstances of Politico that are, are, are particular to, to, to us, but also think of some universal principles that maybe indeed are, are um, uh, relevant to, to people who are trying to sustain publications here or maybe even trying to build new publications uh, in, in Bulgaria and other places around the world. I think both things are true. There's some lessons to be drawn and some things that, uh, that are different. Let me tell you the story of Politico. I was at the Washington Post. I uh, uh, grew up fascinated by politics and uh, so I was quite enchanted uh, by, the, uh, by the publication of the Washington Post. It was a place where many of my heroes uh, people like uh, David Broder, Mary McCrory, who I've mentioned, where they worked, and that's where I wanted to be. And so I, uh, at a pretty young age, when I was in college, I, I kind of uh, did uh, some, uh, caught what I imagine many people here caught that, that sort of bug of journalism where we realized this is uh, what we want to do with our lives. Uh, and and uh, that, that's what happened to me. But I was determined I wanted to work at the Washington Post because it was a place that married my interest in journalism with my interest in politics. And I actually got hired at the Washington Post right after college. I was still 21 years old when I worked there. Uh, and I spent the next 20 years of my career there. Uh, I was doing pretty well. I had uh, covered local news. I went on, uh, then came on to the, the national desk and covered the US military and then I covered the White House under the Clinton years. Uh, and then at some point, happens to a lot of us, uh, we've been a reporter for a while and we realized that uh, it's probably time to grow up and I became an editor. Um, but I was doing rather well, I was climbing the ladder uh, and, and then really getting up kind of near the top end of the ladder. Just my damn luck, the ladder starts to crumble right when I'm there. Uh, uh, the, what we then called, I, I think the term doesn't really apply anymore, but what, the, what we then called the legacy institutions uh, of American journalism, or the old media institutions, uh, were facing, uh, just as I was kind of reaching mid-career, were facing acute challenges to their business model 
which in turn were having uh, powerful negative repercussions on their, uh, their editorial model. Uh, and uh, um, the, the, the future looked rather, uh, rather cloudy. Um, it was in this context that I uh, started thinking about uh, the, uh, whether there was a possibility of a new publication. Uh, the, the, the challenge is I didn't really want to live my life defensively or looking backward to the, the glory days of media, but recognizing that we were in a period of decline and retreat. That didn't seem like a good way uh, uh, to go through one's professional life. Uh, I wanted to, to be on the offensive. Uh, and I wanted to embrace a future-oriented uh, vision for, for journalism. That desire uh, and what became Politico really started with a question, which is, what's next? We, we see uh, one era of, of media ending. Um, I didn't welcome it, but here it was. What's next? Uh, that was the question. And out of that question, uh, our, our answer is the, uh, there are two ideas. Uh, flowed from that, the two very closely related ideas. One was that uh, we believed in a publication that had a really tight editorial focus. Um, our, our particular interests were politics and policy. That's quite different than the model of journalism uh, that I grew up in. Take the Washington Post. It's got a local news section. I work for that. It's got national news. I work for that. I was never a foreign correspondent at the Washington Post, but there was a big team of foreign correspondents. There, there was uh, movie and arts coverage, there was sports coverage, there was local schools coverage. It was a broad lens, um, uh, just as, uh, say, Time Magazine represented a broad lens, or the CBS Evening News represented a broad lens. It seemed to me that the, the publications that were going to thrive in the future uh, would have a narrow editorial lens, uh, that they would really focus in depth on their subjects. And by doing that, they could gain an element, reporters could gain an element of mastery over the subject matter that might be superior uh, to that of those uh, from general interest publications. Uh, and that we could uh, use that mastery uh, to develop a really intimate relationship uh, with the audience. Now, by the way, that's Politico has grown a lot over the years. We cover lots of different topics, but they're still all within the umbrella. You will never come to Politico for sports news. Uh, you go to somewhere else for that. Uh, but we are trying to be the authority, uh, first nationally, but increasingly with global aspirations, we're trying to be the authority on, on uh, politics and public policy. Um, that first point about a narrow editorial focus leads to the second point. Uh, it, the only kind of journalism that I am interested in producing uh, is one that can in some way command uh, a, a premium from the audience. What does that mean to command a premium? Uh, but there's really only two ways that I know to think of it. One is that uh, our content is valuable enough that advertisers uh, want to be next to it. And, and they're, they're willing to pay a lot to be next to it. Um, the opposite of a premium is a sort of a commodity rate, right? If you are the kind of news that is at the at the bottom of some random web page where you, uh, you click on it. And maybe you only get a tenth of a cent uh, for each click. So if you do it that way, you need lots and lots of clicks. Uh, by the way, there's other people doing, experimenting in journalism doing different things. BuzzFeed, for instance, I think they're, they're, uh, 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 they are a general interest publication, and they're all about scale. I don't happen to think it's a, a promising model, but I'm not offering Politico as the, uh, as the only model. Uh, but I do think this notion is really applicable almost anywhere. Asking yourself, can you somehow command a premium from the audience? Well, the way we do it at Politico is with advertising. You pay a lot to be next with us, next to us. Or increasingly, a big part of our business is subscriptions. We don't charge the, the mainstream audience uh, anything to come to our site. That's free. But we do have a whole uh, suite of, uh, of content and, and pub, uh, uh, products. Uh, that are aimed at uh, public policy professionals. Uh, it, the, uh, it's news and analysis and data uh, that we uh, believe makes them better at their jobs. And, and to, uh, 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 to get that, you pay a lot. You, uh, you, you pay a premium for that content. It's a market test, in a sense. Um, and a lot of times, journalists recoil at the market test. Well, we don't want what, the purity of what we do to be uh, sort of uh, uh, influenced by anything relating to uh, 
uh, anything relating to finances. But to be honest, I, I think journalists should welcome a market test uh, because it's a way of saying that somebody values what you do. Uh, and, and that, I think, is true even in, in uh, under different models. Uh, uh, ProPublica, of course, Paul Steiger is here and uh, is the founder of that. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, even there, uh, in a nonprofit context, there's a market test of a sort. Uh, is the investigative work uh, phen phenomenal, groundbreaking, first-class investigative work that ProPublica is producing? Is it compelling enough that local newspapers will say, well, this is valuable, we're eager to run it? Or that the benefactors who have started uh, ProPublica will say, this is worth it, this is worth my, my resources. Uh, uh, it, there's different types of market tests, but I think basically it's a way of saying, is what you're doing valuable enough that you can in some way command a premium. So those two are the two ideas that defined Politica, a tight focus and a determination that we would produce content that in some way could, uh, could thrive uh, in the market and be rewarded uh, by the market. It worked. We've grown steadily uh, over the years. Uh, maybe somebody saw just a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, Politico. Uh, was sold uh, to a, a, a rather well-known European publishing company, Axel Springer, uh, and uh, they're soon to be, uh, once we go to closing, uh, uh, Politico's new owner um, and my new boss. So once again, I'm asking that question, what's next? Um, uh, it, it might well be that I'll be getting my resume in uh, to ProPublica uh, 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 or... or uh, <laughs> or, or somewhere else. Uh, this question of, of what's next is the one that was uh, so much on my mind uh, 15 years ago when we started uh, Politico is, uh, is once again very much on my mind uh, uh, for, for reasons not really relating to me, but really relating to, I think, a very, very fluid and fertile moment uh, in our profession. I, I do think for all the differences in my situation versus somebody who's practicing journalism in Sofia uh, or really anywhere in the world, uh, there are probably some common uh, challenges and there's some common questions. One of those questions is how do we defend and vindicate the values of our profession, of our craft, uh, at a time when the, the, that craft is in such a moment of fluidity and is facing so many challenges, economic challenges as well as political challenges uh, around the world. Um, how do we defend and vindicate those values? One answer I have to that question is we make a, we should all make a difference between what is a, a value and what's a, a kind of a habit or a convention the way we've that's just the way we've always done it. Uh, I, I do think that's really important. There were lots of things that I grew up learning uh, from mentors and editors of mine uh, that represented a, a kind of a body of things that I believed, well, that's the way it's done. That's the way it's always, uh, that's, the, that, that's the way it should be. And, and when you really poke at some of those things, some of those things I would say are values and some are habits. Um, uh, an example of a, a habit is, look, well, when the president makes a speech, we do a hard news story and then we do an analysis next to the side. Well, that's the way it's done. Well, that's not necessarily the only way that it's done. And as audience uh, habits, uh, uh, change. Uh, there's interesting, uh, uh, in some ways, more entertaining, more engaging ways uh, of telling that story. Or occasionally saying, look, the president didn't really say anything interesting. We can chop that down. That's a habit. We have to always be willing to examine our habits and discard them when they're no longer useful. What's a value? A value is, uh, I would say the values that I believe in, is that there's such a thing as fact uh, that uh, uh, not uh, Everything can be understood through the, the prism of opinion or commentary or ideology, and that it's reporters' jobs as best we can to ascertain those facts. Uh, fairness is a value. Um, even people who are writing in an, in an opinion context, I think, still have an, a, an obligation to be fair. It's something uh, that, that we understand. How does this look to somebody who has a different experience or different assumptions than I have? Uh, fairness is a value. Relevance is a value. See, having our work harnessed in some way to the public interest, those are values. And we have to be willing to fight for those values uh, even as we discard habits. Um, uh, another thing that is on my mind, and, and I'd say it's increasingly uh, on my mind, uh, is how do we support and defend institutions in an age uh, when journalism uh, is increasingly uh, driven by the, the uh, uh, 
by the efforts of individuals, that it's increasingly a, a kind of individualistic enterprise. Uh, and, and I have very mixed uh, feelings about that. Uh, in part, Politico was founded because we believed if we put together a collection of interesting individuals, we, we, we could make a publication. A lot of those individuals took, have, over the years, taken their talents and gone off to, uh, to other places in, in ways that we celebrate. Um, th that trend, which has been underway for a good uh, 20 years or so now, is really accelerating. There, there's lots of journalists who don't even really depend on an institutional platform. Uh, they, their work uh, reaches an audience through Facebook, Twitter, Substack. Uh, Jim Fallops, who I mentioned, uh, was, gonna, he, uh, was coming here. He's, I'm not sure if he's leaving the Atlantic, but he's expanding, uh, and much of his work is going to be now published not on the Atlantic, but on Substack. Um, so it's a trend that I can't help but admire. A lot of journalists are uh, um, really uh, creating pretty good profiles and even good incomes from themselves by being sole proprietors. I admire that entrepreneurial spirit. I'm also concerned about it. I am a believer in institutions. Uh, I believe institutions are the vehicle uh, by which generations uh, 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 transmit those values. I described. Uh, I don't think that can be done on an individual basis. I think there are there are institutions uh, like the Washington Post, where I grew up, like the Wall Street Journal that, that Paul Steiger ran, like Politico, uh, are, are good at transmitting values from one generation to the other. And I worry if, if, if institutions aren't fundamentally durable over time. I worry about that transmission of values. I also believe, and this is particularly relevant in, in this part of the world where the work of journalism is under such, uh, uh, is under such a challenge and threat, uh, that institutions are better able to stand up to governments uh, and say, no, we have a right for this story. When a, a journalist is, is uh, harassed or thrown in jail, institutions are better at standing up and saying, uh, 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 for their people, and saying no. Um, and, and if everybody is, uh, is working as a, as a sole proprietor on Twitter or Substack, something like that, uh, uh, I, I think they're going to find that, uh, uh, that they, uh, society loses the benefit uh, of that institutional power. So I am a believer. Uh, in, uh, uh, in institutions. I mentioned sort of the transmission of values through generations. I suppose I should identify kind of my own generational perspective. I was born in 1963, just a, a few weeks before the, the JFK assassination. I, I've talked about this a bunch with journalists uh, my age. There's a sense that we have generationally that we were born just a little too late uh, for what we uh, uh, considered kind of a golden age of journalism. The, the journalists that we grew up uh, admiring uh, and, you, and often getting to know in the later stages of their career, people like Ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post, who I mentioned. Uh, the, this older generation of journalists, uh, the ones that were a good bit older, uh, covered World War II, but the, the ones who were closer in proximity to us uh, uh, made their names covering Vietnam, Watergate, those kind of stories. And, and I always had a sense, well, that was just a little before me. Uh, and at the same time, uh, journalists and actually not that much uh, younger than me, and certainly those who are a good bit younger than me, 20, 30 years, can really make me feel old and obsolete. Uh, there is a, a, a style of journalism uh, that uh, is just different than the one uh, that I grew up in. Many parts of it I admire, uh, the, 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 uh, the initiative, the ambition, the intelligence, the creativity that we're seeing in a younger, journal of, uh, younger generation of journalists. Some parts of it give me pause. Um, uh, I recognize that one thing I believe, uh, the primacy of fact and the value of, uh, of a, a kind of journalism of independence and detachment, uh, that uh, many younger journalists don't believe in that. Uh, I thought I would spend just a minute uh, 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 defending that, if I may. Um, uh, I believe uh, that uh, uh, there, there is enormous power in uh, journalism that is uh, focused primarily on facts uh, and uh, that, uh, that keeps a distance from the, uh, the battle from pow for power, at least the battle for, for power in a partisan sense. Uh, 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 
it, the, that power comes from our ability to set the agenda and be respected by the audience, to play that historic role of journalists as, as referees uh, rather than participants or advocates in, in, the, the, uh, in the battle for power. Um, that's what detachment, uh, detachment means. It's not because we don't care, it's because we do care and we're trying to preserve our power as journalists. I would say when, when uh, younger journalists especially uh, 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 challenge me on this and, and say um, they don't believe that. They want to be able to both cover a story and uh, c cover the protest and participate in the protest. Um, uh, that they think there's a kind of weakness in that older brand of, uh, of journalism that I've described. My answer to them usually is that detachment doesn't mean neutrality in the great uh, sort of moral issues uh, of the day, and in particular the great moral issues that face in journalism. Um, uh, I'm not neutral uh, on the uh, uh, facts versus uh, lies and propaganda on one side. We're, uh, I'm not neutral on that. I'm pro-fact. Uh, I'm not neutral on the question of uh, transparency in government versus secrecy and evasion. We're on one side, this is the side of openness and light. Um, journalists who believe as I do, we're not neutral on the question of the dignity and the fundamental rights of the individual uh, versus those who would, uh, who would crush individuals and crush their rights uh, in the name of ideological convictions or just a crude uh, pursuit of power. Um, we are on one side of what I consider some of the great moral tests of our time. And I would just close with, uh, uh, with this thought, that uh, uh, the, the challenge of uh, journalism at this particular moment in history uh, is really closely connected with the challenge of uh, free societies uh, and liberal societies and, and the belief in pluralism uh, against those who believe something quite different. Um, I think that we're in a moment of history that's really going to be, over the next generation, every bit as consequential as uh, uh, a moment our parents or grandparents uh, faced uh, uh, 80 years ago in World War II and in the period coming out of the Cold War, is that there's fundamentally a clash of values going on in the world. Um, you've got uh, uh, one model, pluralism as it's practiced in the United States and, and, and in Europe. Uh, the, um, uh, is, a model I believe in, but it's also a kind of fumbling uh, often to meet the challenges uh, of the day. You've got two different models uh, to the east of here. You've got a kind of a crude, backward-looking model represented by authoritarianism uh, in, in Russia, uh, Putin throwing his enemies, including journalists in jail. In the other direction, uh, you have China representing uh, uh, what they see is not a backward-looking vision, but a very future-oriented vision, uh, but it is based on control. It's not based on, uh, on openness, on pluralism, on the rights of individuals. And I think that's going to be the great uh, test uh, that journalists are very much a part of in this generation ahead. And really all the important issues in the world um, take place in that context. Uh, and I think journalists have an enormous responsibility in covering those issues. Uh, 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 to me, the, the big question facing uh, governments over the next, uh, facing free societies generally over the next uh, generation, it involved the intersection of uh, kind of scientific possibilities. Uh, it, some of those possibilities exhilarating, some of them terrifying. Uh, that intersection with, with those, uh, with questions of power, who has it, who doesn't, and questions of humane values. What kind of society do we live in? Let me just explain that for a moment. Climate change is an obvious example. The future of the world uh, is at stake uh, based on our ability to come up with, uh, with ideas that can, uh, uh, that can uh, uh, halt climate change or mitigate its worst effects. What are the remedies? Well, journalists are the ones who can shine a light on that. Uh, how about technology? Um, it's unclear whether technology and all the advances in artificial intelligence and the rest are going to be an enlightenment, uh, an instrument of, uh, of enlightenment and individual empowerment, um, or, as we see in China, instruments of manipulation, surveillance, and control. Healthcare. The pandemic uh, really showed us the value of journalism. Here's a complex story uh, in which uh, the facts are not completely clear, uh, but they become more clear 
based on reporting, based on evidence, uh, based on shining a light on a particular story, uh, and who but journalists can uh, illuminate that uh, on a sort of important question that really affected everybody's health and was a matter of life and death. Uh, these are the kind of questions that I think shadow our future, and it just seems so obvious to me uh, that there's no way society is going to get a right answer to this without the kind of journalism uh, that does defend those values I described, uh, even as we adapt in all kinds of different ways uh, due to technology to, to meet the audience uh, where they are. Uh, the ways that we tell stories uh, are going to be constantly change, changing, but the value of those stories and the value of what we do as, as journalists seems to me uh, to be a constant. Uh, so once again, I'll, I'll end with where, um, uh, where I started. What's next? What's next for our profession? Uh, I, I just think, uh, and we see it on the agenda for this conference, uh, there's so many interesting ideas about what's next. Uh, it's going to be a period of incredible fluidity, incredible experimentation, uh, great possibilities, and, and uh, I, I think it just could be, uh, couldn't be a more exciting moment to explore those possibilities, uh, uh, constantly changing, well, fighting for things that, in, in my mind, should never change, their timeless values. Uh, uh, that start with the uh, uh, start with the readers and, and their right to understand the world we live in. Um, so anyway, that's what I believe in, uh, uh, and I think that is uh, the context in which we we started Politico, and I, I hope we will continue to grow it over the next uh, uh, the next 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, David. The question for you, and it's going to be hybrid, of course, because I hope some of you have thought of some questions they're going to ask them. We're getting some questions in from the people who are watching live streaming, but can we start off with a, a question from the live audience? Does anybody have a, and, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of monitor that, but we have some microphones that will come your way. So I, 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 you're going to be challenged here right away by a nonprofit person on that market, <laughs> market value, I bet. Um, Paul Steiger. Hi, John. Thank you for a really wonderful, wonderful speech. You said you didn't want to give a speech, but you gave a really very nice one. Thank you. And I just want to ask you, you, know, you were making some news yourself um, recently with a, a big deal with Axel Springer. And I wondered if you could talk about, because you achieved so much um, independently, what do you hope to gain through this affiliation and, and, and uh, sale, and what are the advantages and risks you see in going that, that route? Sure. Thank you. And, and just a bit of context to uh, Paul Steiger's questions for those who didn't see it. Uh, but Politico was uh, originally started uh, with money uh, not through venture capital, but through uh, uh, a, a single owner uh, who um, I got to know in a small group of uh, uh, other uh, co-founders got to know, and we decided to lock arms together. Uh, and, and he operated in the context of a family business uh, that gave him uh, uh, access to, to resources and also gave him great uh, uh, flexibility. Um, uh, from the moment that we had the idea to, look, let's go ahead and do this, uh, to, uh, and, and to the actual first day of publication of Politico, it was only two months. Uh, uh, we built a website and hired a staff in just two months. We were able to do that because we were in the context of a, of a family business. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that, that person is our publisher, Robert Albritton. Uh, Robert agreed uh, uh, over the course of the summer that maybe it was time to sell Politico. He's had offer and offer and offer over the years and never wanted to do it. Uh, he's always laudably believed, uh, no, there's more work for me to do. There's more value to be created. Um, the, 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 the purchaser of Politico is Axel Springer. It's a company probably many of you know because they're very, uh, a very large presence here in Europe. Uh, and, and there are people that I've got to know well uh, because our, our venture in Europe is a, is a joint venture. It's owned 50% by Politico in the United States and 50% and by Axel Springer. So this was a, a kind of a good a dating period, if you will. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and now we're 
we're married, of course, it's involuntary from my perspective, but I'm, uh, 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 but I'm still enthusiastic about it. And the reason I'm enthusiastic about it is that I felt we had reached the, uh, uh, the, the limits of what we could do in a family business. It wasn't so much that we lacked for uh, financial capital as, in a sense, intellectual capital. Uh, there's, a, there's a world of interesting things uh, going on uh, in media, in the, 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 the challenges of how you, uh, um, how you reach an audience, engage an audience, uh, and also build a viable business model around that. Uh, and, and Axel Springer's a very ambitious company. Um, their CEO, Matthias Doffner, uh, who some, maybe some of you met, if you ever do, he'll, he's about seven feet tall. Um, but he's a very commanding, uh, 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 a dynamic leader. Incidentally, he's in, of that same generation. I think we're more or less the same age. Maybe he's a little older than me. Uh, but we're of that generation that sees ourselves as a, of a bridge generation between one era of journalism that we grew up uh, admiring and this new era of journalism where we, we really feel that we're trying to uh, um, uh, invent new business models to support the, the journalism we believe in. Uh, I think that we can, um, um, it's going to allow us to, to, uh, to grow more rapidly, Paul, uh, to, to uh, create more journalism, more content in more places, um, and I hope still have more fun doing it. Um, uh, so that's the opportunity. The challenges, um, they don't loom especially large uh, in my mind. Uh, um, uh, there's always the chance that uh, um, in a corporate context, maybe you can things become a bit more bureaucratic, uh, but that's not the culture of Axel Springer. And I would have to say, even as we grew from a couple dozen people to uh, currently a thousand, we're already sort of battling that challenge. That's more just a, 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 a kind of a constant when you grow. You have to make sure that you keep the things that uh, help you grow in the first place. Um, uh, so I, I'm rather optimistic. Uh, there's a slightly different tradition, a journalistic tradition of, uh, of uh, Axel Springer. Um, comes, of course, the company's named after an individual, Axel Springer, who, who uh, uh, started the, the, the company and grew it in the wake of World War II in Germany. Uh, so that's a very uh, uh, particular historical context in which that company was uh, was founded. They have a set of, uh, of company principles, um, uh, some of which are, are, are kind of uh, unexceptional about the value of, of, of free press and independent journalism, others of which are a little more charged. Uh, uh, Axel Springer, one of its corporate uh, principles is that it supports the state of Israel. Um, which is, I, I, I'm fine with, uh, um, uh, and yet it's, uh, uh, to an American audience, it seems odd to have that as a, as a corporate principle because in U.S. journalism, we just simply don't, uh, uh, don't do that. So we're kind of wrestling with that. Uh, the, the, our U.S. journalists, or for that matter, our European political journalists aren't required to um, uh, uh, endorse uh, the, the corporate principles, uh, but there's, uh, particularly among uh, some of the younger journalists, there's some unease with that. Um, uh, and I have to say, well, to me it doesn't seem that exotic. Uh, um, I, I worked at the Washington Post where the, 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 the company principles were articulated every day on the editorial page, but that didn't, uh, um, didn't inhibit me from reporting the story wherever I took it. And uh, I, I really think it's the equivalent of that. So anyway, it, it's a new era, but they're, they're a good owner. Uh, Ben Bradley, uh, who, Paul, you probably knew, uh, uh, he said, you know, the secret to a great uh, publication is a great owner, period. Uh, and I've only uh, worked for three in my career. The uh, Graham family is the owners of the Washington Post. Robert Albritton, who is uh, uh, our, uh, our publisher of Politico, and now Axel Springer. And it seems to me that I've, uh, I've been very lucky. There's so many bad owners out there uh, who are... Uh, um, uh, who are hedge funds or who have a short-term mentality. They're just trying to, to ride the, the old car till it breaks down. Um, and, and so to work for uh, uh, an enlightened, ambitious, creative owner, this seems to me a great privilege. Uh, John, let me, let me ask you a question from, from, a, from the live, live stream audience. That's okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to read this. Um, John, your admiration for the importance of institutions and the need to defend is truly respectable. This is understandable in a country with well-established and independently functioning institutions. But how do you think a journalist can play such a role in a region with low trust and integrity of institutions, regardless of who is in power? Well, as I, um, as I said at the beginning, I sort of approached the question with, with great humility. 
uh, in, in that I grew up in a context where there are those institutions, uh, and, and there's a there's a legal and political and cultural tradition of supporting those institutions. Uh, that's not the case uh, in uh, many countries, and not the case in uh, many countries in this region. Um, and so it seems to me the journalists uh, practicing as uh, uh, in many cases as uh, almost sole practitioners, uh, they, they face a especially heroic uh, task of uh, of uh, 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 of doing their work without that institutional support, and I hope that the most successful of them will um, uh, will end up because of their success creating institutions uh, that one thing builds on another, and something that smart starts small uh, can uh, um, uh, can become something big and durable. Um, but I, I appreciate the 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 point of the question, and uh, it, it seems to me that that is uh, the challenge, uh, and, and supported by work uh, that you do at WPI, that Nancy's doing, really part of that work is, is, to, uh, uh, is to build institutions, build homes based on, uh, on sound values uh, uh, that endure uh, for, for talented people to do their work. Um, but until those institutions are built, what you have are just brave people trying to tell stories as best they can through whatever medium is available uh, to them uh, amidst all kinds of adversity and obstacles. Is there a question here from the live audience? Yes, Rena. for your speech. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned the, uh, how, how valuable it is to have, uh, uh, for, for the advertisers, uh, to be next uh, to your articles in Politico. And uh, my question is, did you have uh, cases to reject advertisement from certain companies? Do you check the integrity of the companies? Because uh, I think this is quite a relevant question about the uh, Bulgarian uh, economic and business environment. Yeah. Um, if you could mm, go through these uh, shoes <laughs> when we have some doubts, for instance, about the integrity of the companies. Uh, in other words, just to make sure that the people advertising are actually. Uh, um, uh, trying to advertise propaganda or, or to uh, exert control over the publication through their advertising? Uh, if you doubt the integrity of the company mm -hmm. uh, that wants to be next to a political article, uh, what would you do? Sure. Um, well, I come from kind of an American tradition on this subject where publications generally have had very sort of liberal standards uh, that somebody, uh, um, the, the news side gets to publish uh, the truth as best uh, we can ascertain it and people that have messages of other kinds uh, um, uh, get to buy their, their advertisement and, and say what they want. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that they can say anything that they want. I, I think uh, 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 um, that on occasions, uh, publications like the New York Times, and on a handful of occasions, Politico uh, has uh, uh, has done this, have, have rejected advertising. This just false. It's manipulative. It's misleading uh, for for the uh, uh, for the reader. Um, uh, in some cases, it's um, uh, just in poor taste that we don't want to inflict uh, on the uh, on the reader. And so, I, I do think. Um, Newsrooms, reporters and editors are, are, uh, can only thrive and do their work when they're supported by publishers. And I think publishers do have to make judgments um, of this sort. Uh, and I, I can imagine a, a conscientious and, uh, a publisher saying, no, that's advertising that I won't take. Um, you know, what's more often the case, um, uh, and is, uh, is quite common, is, uh, uh, is not, uh, uh, turning away advertising, but advertisers turning away because they don't like uh, what the news side uh, wrote about them. And uh, um, uh, you know, we, we were talking just a moment about Axel a moment ago about Axel Springer and uh, Matthias Doffner. Uh, 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 Volkswagen pulled uh, thirty million dollars a year in advertising uh, 
uh, from Axel Springer Publications because they didn't like, uh, I think in this case it was DeVelt's uh, reporting on the, the scandal, the emissions scandal at Volkswagen. And that's just the uh, uh, enlightened owners, that's what they do. Uh, they say uh, um, uh, if somebody needs to take their advertising dollars and go, so be it. Um, um, and, and they go, and, and ultimately they usually come back, but not always. Um, uh, in this case, uh, Volkswagen did come back uh, to Axel Springer, but uh, you know I'm sure the 30 million stung when it when they left. But th that's just the price that you pay for responsible journalism. Um, uh, it comes up uh, a version of your question comes up. Uh, um, in a very contemporaneous way. Uh, there are some uh, um, uh, NGOs um, and different uh, public policy groups uh, that are pressuring publications, including Politico, to no longer take uh, money from energy companies um, uh, 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 in the fossil fuel industry. Um, because uh, we, we do take advertising from uh, lots of different energy companies. Uh, they sponsor different uh, editorial products or events that we do. Always a line between the, uh, the, the business uh, side of it and the, the editorial content. They don't get to influence the content, but they do get to advertise against it. And there are some people that say, we shouldn't do that, including some people on the staff. Uh, they say, well, we should stop taking that money. Uh, and. Uh, um, um, I think those arguments are going to be uh, uh, ventilated. Uh, for me, though, the, to the extent that people aren't sitting in my voice, there would be a, a pretty high threshold um, where I would say, look, I'm just not going to take somebody's uh, advertising dollar um, um, uh, because most of these issues are more complex. Um, uh, uh, and I regard the, the, the question of transitioning to a clean energy future as, as, uh, as one of those. So um, anyway, it, it's a good question. It comes up. Uh, uh, and in general, the work, I would say, the, the work of the responsibilities of publishers are different than the responsibilities of editors and reporters. Okay, uh, another uh, question from the live stream audience. And this um, questioner says that, uh, I think she pl she's playing the devil's advocate here, but really? how do you argue with the new trendy advocacy journalism trend and the, and the big discussion about the crisis of objectivity method as either a privileged expression of a majoritarian view or as simply as an impossible goal to reach due to commercial commercialism in the media? Um. Well, I recognize I have a particular perspective on this question. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, um, uh, I, I believe that there's a, there's a, a very robust, very important role uh, for people who approach journalism uh, not through an advocacy point of view, but through, as I say, the uh, through uh, independence and, and a certain degree of detachment from from the fight for power. Um, the reason I believe that is I, I think ultimately over the long run there's more power in that model than there is in the uh, um, uh, than in an advocacy uh, uh, oriented model. I think we people who report have special responsibilities and, and we also have great privileges. Like we we know what's going on. Um, uh, if we reduce ourselves to just another voice in the in the great argument uh, and become primarily advocates. Uh, then the reporter is really no different than um, uh, seven billion other people on the planet who've got a who've got an opinion, uh, and, and so I, I think our power comes from uh, from uh, letting the reporting lead the way rather than the commentary or the advocacy lead the way. Um, but also, uh, um, I, I don't worry too much over who's right or wrong on this because uh, um, uh, there's a proliferation of both models uh, and there, there always will be. So uh, somebody can uh, uh, not think I'm right on this question, doesn't stop Politico from practicing that kind of journalism uh, or I can say well, the kind of journalism that other people practice isn't the, uh, the kind that I want to practice. And so what? Uh, we, we, we both do our thing and uh, ultimately uh, the reader benefits to some degree from both. Another question from the live audience. Anyone out there have a? I've got some more from the streaming audience. Okay, think of those questions. <laughs> um, so, uh, another question from the live stream 
uh, audience. That you said you are, you said that there are engaging ways to cover the uh, president's address to the nation and then analyze it. Mm -hmm. Could you please share some of the approaches that you have in Politico? Oh, we can. We always try in Politico if we can. Um, uh, to have some fun with things, um, if it's a, if it's a, a, a appropriate, um, it's not appropriate in every case, but in some cases uh, we uh, do. In some cases, even when it's not appropriate, we do it anyway. Um, uh, um, so one of the things we did in the early days, uh, we don't do it as often these days. Uh, uh, the president will make a speech, and it'll be uh, we'll do what he said and what he meant, um, uh, and it's a. Uh, uh, it's often written in a, a highly irreverent uh, way. It's really just a different form of something I, I wrote dozens or hundreds of when I was a White House reporter of the news analysis. Um, but it's a news analysis written in a, in a particular voice uh, that is, uh, uh, we think, maybe more engaging and in its own ways but possibly gets closer to the, the, the truth of the matter. Um, uh, uh, so that would be a, 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 we write things at Politico all the time that if they had appeared in the Washington Post and you know when I was a, a White House reporter in the 1990s uh, they would have looked downright strange um, um, uh, but they're entirely natural in our pages now one thing that's happened is that I think they wouldn't look as strange um, I, I don't think Politico takes all the credit but we're probably a, a, a stimulant uh, 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 to it is lots of uh, things that uh, appear in the New York Times or the Washington Post that never would have appeared uh, in, uh, um, uh, in those publications in the old days. I, I think there's a certain uh, obsessive approach and a, a certain uh, uh, kind of more conversational voice to, to storytelling uh, that's been adapted uh, throughout the industry. Uh, it used to be, and I sort of grew up believing this, that the, uh, the uh, uh, Journalists for places like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, uh, part of a, uh, uh, our authority came from assuming a, a, a sort of a, an oracular voice, right? That there was a way of writing things and it was a, um, a, it was a kind of a solemn. Uh, and, and we presumed that our relationship with the, the audience was uh, enhanced by that solemnity. They'd take us serious. And, and I, I've come to believe that uh, as you know, reader habits change and so forth. That actually, that, that sort of solemnity or that that austere voice uh, is actually the, uh, the 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 enemy of what we want, which is uh, is connection and engagement and uh, um, and uh, and clarity and truth telling. Any audience questions? Okay, you got one there, dude. Yeah, where? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it is now. Thank you for the uh, insights. I have, a, I have a technology question, more or less. Mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, legacy institutions, organizations like the Washington Post, mm -hmm. are experimenting with video and more so recently. And to a certain degree, the, their video experiments have been very successful in a way and very interesting and attractive to, to the um, audience, probably attracting younger audiences. Mm -hmm. Have you considered experimenting or introducing visual storytelling, not just videos, but graphics, photography, different types of using those means to attract a different type of audience? Thank you. Most of our experiments at Politico um, have been uh, kind of not on that front have been maybe not that successful. Uh, um, uh, video in particular, we've dabbled with a, a bunch of different times and never really, uh, sometimes with interesting kind of editorial results, but never with uh, uh, attractive publishing results. Uh, that is, that, that, that test that I laid out in my talk, can you command a premium for this? Are you creating something that's valuable enough that somebody will uh, want to pay for it at advertising or subscriptions? We've not had, um, success uh, to date uh, with that. Um, uh, so that doesn't mean we halt, it just means we, we go back at it. Um, uh, I, I would uh, agree with your appraisal of the Washington Post. I see them with a new owner, Jeff Bezos, uh, 
just throwing lots of investment money at uh, different experiments, uh, most of which, by my lights, at some remove, like similarly aren't, um, aren't, aren't terribly successful. Um, but if maybe a small percentage of them are, then that creates a pathway toward, uh, uh, toward the future. So I, I, um, I do have misgivings, uh, to be honest, about a, uh, a publication like the Washington Post being owned by um, uh, Jeff Bezos. Think of it in this new world that we live in. Amazon's effectively almost a nation state. Um, and uh, so I, I don't like uh, the owner of a, of a nation state also owning the, uh, the, the, the publication in the, in the nation's capital. I'm uneasy about it philosophically. As a practical matter, it seems like he's been a, a, a conscientious uh, owner and, and, and has revitalized that paper with I spent so many years and, and so that's a good thing but I do have some unease with it um, and uh, um, I do uh, uh, I, I do agree with you that the uh, the, the, the uh, connecting with the the next generation of audience uh, is is going to involve a lot more experimentation in uh, uh, sort of visual storytelling um, and, and I mean we're already seeing this in lots of different ways the 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 um, uh, the distinctions between platforms that we used to make, well, that's video, that's audio, that's, that's text, uh, they're becoming blurred, and, and a lot of the most engaging content it includes elements of all three. Uh, so anyway, that's one place where Politico is, uh, presumably with a new owner, is uh, w w I'm expecting uh, that we're going to plunge in more vigorously and, and probably in a more sustained way than we have to date in that area. I hope so. Let me ask you another question. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure this um, represents what you said, so if it doesn't uh, uh, say so, but this uh, questioner said that you were impartial in the conflict between facts and propaganda, but the- No, 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 I was, uh, uh, the opposite is what I- uh, That's what I thought, yeah, but mm -hmm. the, qu her, the second part of the question, I think, is one that you can respond to. How, how, do, you, um, how do you maintain that position, uh, or I guess, how, how do you maintain a position about facts when even reasonable people people tend to question facts and mistrust the intents and integrity of the media. Um, sure, I, I mean, and, and just to take the the misinterpretation at the beginning and, and clarify my view, I believe that journalism uh, is a is a moral enterprise. It, it's a it's a profoundly important moral endeavor to get to uh, uh, to seek the truth, uh, even as it's a uh, uh, it's. Our understanding of the truth is often fragmentary. Uh, it, it, things are never illuminated all at once. It requires reporting, and you get some version of the, of the truth, the best you can ascertain, then you come back tomorrow and report again, and the day after that, and the day after that. And you never get a full picture, but you get a, a, a complete picture. That leads to the second part of the, uh, uh, of the person's question, uh, like how do you uh, build that uh, uh, relationship of trust when lots of people are mistrustful? Um, uh, it's a, it's a signature, very lamentable, unfortunate signature of U.S. politics, but in politics in many, many countries uh, that uh, nobody uh, even agrees on basic facts. We're, 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 we've divided into almost tribal, um, uh, 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 almost tribal di divisions in, in which everybody has their own kind of set of, 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 of things they believe, uh, and the, the, the notion of that there's a a body of fact that we can uh, try to ascertain collectively and agree on that and then have arguments about the implications of those facts, like that, that, that notion is, is not believed by many. Um, 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 but precisely because it's, uh, um, that, that, uh, that, that notion is, is, is under, such, um, under such challenge uh, is why we need to keep at it and, and keep doing it. And the good news is that uh, I, I believe that that brand of journalism is much more durable than the, the sort of propagandistic uh, 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 brand of journalism. When there's a really big story, um, well, even in a, uh, probably in, a, in American context, people can understand that. If there's a, a something uh, really big happening, uh, an emergency of some sort, I'm not going to tune into Fox News uh, for their version of it any more than I'm going to tune into MSNBC. I'm going to tune into uh, CNN's maybe diluted its, uh, uh, especially domestically as opposed to internationally, it's diluted its reputation it used to have for kind of the, being a, a, a truly news-driven platform as they 
get into a lot of advocacy, but I'm going to, I'm going to turn to the places that I, I believe are oriented. When the store is most important, I, I'm uh, most likely, and I think most, uh, uh, most of the audience is most likely to turn to, to places that do, uh, are, are driven fundamentally uh, by reporting and, and by um, um, uh, objectivity as best we can attain it. Obviously, it's imperfect, uh, rather than places that, uh, that, that start with a, uh, an ideological perspective. Yeah. Uh, so w when it matters most, the, the, the kind of journalism I'm, I'm talking about is most valuable. Well, I, I think that's a good uh, place to uh, stop. Thank you so much for your, your speech and answering questions. Enjoyed it yeah. quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to take a we're going to take a 15 minute break now before the first panel. And I'm going I'm going to start enforcing that schedule a little bit harder. So we will start at a hard start at 11:15. Okay. Thank you. John. He means it. Thank you.